بسم الله الرحمن الرحيم الحمد لله رب العالمين وصلى الله وبارك على الأشرف الأنبياء والمرسلين نبينا محمد وعلى آله وصحبه وسلم تسليما كثيرا أما بعد فهيا الله جميعا وبارك الله فيكم الحمد لله this is the continuation of the شرح السنة lessons that we've been going through for the past few months um, but just that today will be the first day in where we will begin going through this book on Saturday evenings inshallah and um, alhamdulillah we previously were discussing the Sahaba and the status of the companions right, their status and we reached the final part of the discussion where we were discussing the companions and from amongst them the Ashra Mubashireen bil Jannah are the ten who were given glad times of Jannah. Now the reason why they hold a particular status or high regard within the Ummah is not just for the fact that they were guaranteed Jannah However, it was the manner in which they were, it was mentioned, they were mentioned all together. All ten of them were mentioned together, Barakallahu Fikum. And so thus, for amongst the Muslims and their imma, they hold these individuals from the companions in high regard. So, before we begin and we'll continue with the biographies, and we conclude the biographies of them, and we've done... Eight of the ten so far, so there's only two left. Uh, we mentioned just some some short passages regarding them. Who can remember who they are? Who can tell me who all ten are? The four the? The four who are? Abu Bakr. Abu Bakr. Um, Ali. Uthman Ali. Ali. Uh, Abdurrahman ibn Auf. Saad ibn Abi Waqas. Saad ibn Abi Are you asking me what's name? Saeed. Saeed ibn Zubair. No. And Amir. I don't know. Amir. Abu Abeda. No. Amir ibn Jarrah. No. Talha. Talha. I can't lie, I've lost count. You have got anyone left? Nine, there's one left. Zubair. Abdullah bin Zubair. Abdullah bin Zubair. Zubair. Nah, Omar. Again, who could give me the ten? Should be easy. He started, he gave you the. He did it for you. Who gave me the ten? I know most of your names, so I'll ask you my name. Nah, I'm told them. Abdullah bin Zubair. Nah. Taz, no, but a bit louder because I don't think everyone heard you. Abu Bakr, Abu Bakr, Omar, Omar, Omar Uthman, Uthman, Ali, Ali Saeed, Saeed, Saad, Saad, Saad Ibn Aufin, Ibn Aufin, Talha, Talha Amir, Amir, and Zubair, Nawa. This is the ten. So we've done, we've mentioned all of them other than, Yani, uh, Saad. <coughs> Ibn Abi Uqas. And his name is Sa'ad Ibn Malik Ibn, Uh-ha- Ibn Uhayb <coughs> Al Qurshi Al Zuhri. And he was from the last of the Ashur al Bashirin to pass away. He's from the last amongst them to pass away. And the Messenger of Allah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam mentioned regarding him Allahumma istajib li sa'adin ida da'ak He mentioned sallallahu alayhi wa sallam Oh Allah, answer Sa'ad, yani his supplication if he calls upon you Now this is a du'a from the Messenger of Allah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam for this individual 
that his du'a has been answered. Amr al something which is of great <coughs> stature, that not only is the Muslim asking Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala for your du'a to be answered, but none other than the Messenger of Allah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. Also to mention regarding Sa'd ibn Abi Waqas, that he remained within his home, Lazim Abayt, in the Qatar of Uthman. So he remained within his home at the time of the killing of Uthman. This is due to the fact that the killing of Uthman, no doubt, is regarded as a fitna. Or is regarded as being a fitna, a trial. And this is in uh, accordance with the statement of Muhammad ibn Sirin, where he mentions, Lam nakun nas an al isnad. We don't used to ask about the isnad. Falamma waqa'at al fitna, kulna sammu lana rijalakum. And so he mentions the fitna. And so when the fitna, however, when the fitna occurred, we stated, Name your men. Uh, Muhammad ibn Sirin. So we didn't used to ask about Isnad. Meaning what, Barakallah Fikum? Why didn't they ask about Isnad? This Tabi image, they didn't ask about Isnad. Why? Why wouldn't they ask about Isnad? The chain. Because the companions of the Prophet Naam. The majority of the companions. And everyone was, trust, was trusted. Then the fitna occurred. Now in the fitna of the Qatar of Uthman. And so when the fitna occurred, the killing of Uthman, Ibn Affan, then they stated, name your men. And then they had to ask about the men. Because now, what has become apparent is mukhalafat al Opposition to the truth. What has become apparent with that as well, now is deviation. So they had to ask. Al Muhim, due to the fact that it was a fitna, <coughs> Naam, Sa'ad and Abu Qas remained within the home. Naam, at that time. So this is just some, small, some short words regarding Sa'ad and Abu Qas. Finally, <coughs> we have Abu Ubaidah. The final of the ten is Abu Ubaidah. And his name is Abu Ubaidah, Amir ibn Abdullah. Ibn Jarrah, Al Qurshi, Al Fahri, Amir, Ibn Abdullah, Ibn Al Amir, Ibn Abdullah, Ibn Jarrah, Al Qurshi, Al Fahri. So he's Abu Abeda. Abu Abeda, along with the following, Uthman, Ibn Ma, Ibn Ibn Madhun, Uthman, Ibn Madhun. Naam, Ubaidah ibn Harith. Abdurrahman ibn Auf. Abu Salama. Abu Salama. So we mentioned Uthman ibn Mad'un. Ubaidah ibn Harith. Abdurrahman ibn Auf and Abu Salama. All of them, including as we mentioned Abu Ubaidah, all of them embraced Islam at the same time. All of them embraced Islam at the same time. Within an hour of the Messenger of Allah Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam entering the home of Arkham. Within an hour of that. So this is at the, the beginning establishing the da'wah of the Messenger of Allah Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. And these individuals all embraced Islam within an hour of that time. And he was from the companions that made Hijra Hajra Hijratain. So he made Hijra twice. Referring to what, Barakallahu Fikum? He said he made Hijra twice. <coughs> when and then when? No. They went to uh, Ethiopia or Abyssinia. Abyssinia, Ethiopia, they went with their Naam. And then? Uh, Medina. Then Medina, Naam. And so, Abu Abayda made Hijrah twice. He made Hijrah both times. 
And he was present at the Battle of Badr. He was present at the Battle of Badr. And so he witnessed the Battle of Badr and everything that occurred after that. Now, the Battle of Badr was in which year? Which year was the Battle of Badr? Second year of the Hijra, which month? Ramadan. Ramadan. So he, he was present in the Battle of Badr and then witnessed everything after that. So everything that occurred from, from the, the major events of the seer of the Messenger of Allah, Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, from the second year there and onwards. Now he witnessed that. Now, likewise as well, we have the narration of the Messenger of Allah, Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, which is found in the Sahihain, found in Bukhari and Muslim, where the Nabi, alayhi salatu wasalam, he mentions, لِكُلِّ أُمَّةٍ أَمِينٍ وَأَمِينَ هَذِهِ الْأُمَّةِ أَبُوْ عَبَيْدَ إِبْنَ جَرَّحِ He says, for every ummah is an ameen, the one that is regarded as being the trustworthy. And for this ummah, the ameen is Abu Abayd ibn Jarrah. <coughs> Likewise, Abu Abayd was sent to Sham. Now, he was sent to Sham during the time of the Khilafah of Abu Bakr Sadiq. And in this Conquest of Sham, he conquered the majority of it. And it's said that he died at the age of 58. And this is Abu Ubaidah. So these are the 10. Now these are the 10. What do they all, they all have in common? For those that have written all of the biographies. What do they all have in common? Something that they, have, they all have in common. Hassan, you wrote all ten? Mm. Now, what do they all have in common then? Mahajirin. They were? Mahajirin. Well, Mahajirin. That's one thing. So if they were from the Mahajirin, then what? Yeah. The foremost to accept Islam. The foremost to accept Islam. They were from those that were from the foremost to, ex- for, to embrace Islam. So when the da'wah or the Messenger of Allah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam came to them, they were from those that accepted it, yani, almost instantaneously. And so this is from some of, the, some of the reasons mentioned as to why they're mentioned amongst these individuals. Because they aided the da'wah of the Messenger of Allah, sallallahu alayhi wa in his first instance. Naam, before anything else. So before, before anything occurred, they, they aided and they were with him. And so when we mention, when we mention, the matter of the companions and their makana, their status. We mention their status due to the fact that they were the individuals that aided the Messenger of Allah, Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, in his dawah, in his conquests, and they aided him in the spreading of Islam and the, and the yani, preservation of it and its texts. This is something which is Adin. The fact that we have these books, Baina Aidina, we have these books amongst us today. We have these ahadith that have been memorized. We have these ayat, the Quran memorized. Now, it's by way of the juhud of the companions. By the way, the fact that the companions exerted themselves in the preservation of Islam and the Nusuls, the texts. That the companions exerted themselves in the preservation of Islam and the da'wah of the Messenger of Allah. So no doubt, those that were the first and foremost in that matter, then they are mentioned with even more fadl, virtue. This is something that we mentioned previously as well. We were mentioned the virtue of the companions. And it was in an ordinal matter, manner. Now that they have this in a particular order. And from those that were mentioned first and foremost, of those that embraced Islam in its first instance. And Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala knows best. So now, that concludes what we wanted to discuss in relation to the companions of the Messenger of Allah, Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. And so here, we want to go on to the second topic of the day, of this evening, and the next uh, chapter, or the next point, mentioned by Imam Baba Hari, which is in relation to a sama' wa ta'a, yani hearing and obeying. Uh, of the Arabic text. The beginning was, وَسَمْعُ wa ta'a lil a'imma. والسمع والطاعة للأئمة فيما يحب الله ويرضى 
ومن ولي الخلافة بإجماع الناس عليه ورضاهم به فهو أمير المؤمنين ولا يحل لأحد أن يبيت ليلة ولا يرى أن ليس عليه إمام برا كان أو فاجرا جزاك الله خير and uh, just because you're right in front of me with the English text hmm? do you have it as well? خلاص بعض الغنى شو؟ Yes, Father, please. Uh, is it to build the tree to listen to the Muslim leaders and obey them in what Allah loves and is pleased with? And whoever becomes a Khalifa by the consensus of the people as well as their being pleased with him is regarded as a leader of the believers. It is not permissible for anyone to spend the night without considering that he has a leader, regardless of whether he, the leader, is righteous or immoral. No. So, this is the matter regarding the. Muslim rulers <coughs> Now the rulers And so Sheikh Fawzan he mentions Min usul ahlu sunnati wal jama'a Mabniya ala kitabi la wa sunnati rasul Sallallahu alayhi wa sallam Assamu wa ta'a Li walati al-umur al-muslimin Li walati al-umur al-muslimin So From the usul of ahlu sunnah From the foundation of ahlu sunnah Is and that's which is derived and built upon the nusuls, the texts of the kitab and the sunnah. The sunnah of the Messenger of Allah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. Is here in a vein in relation to the leaders of the Muslims. The leaders amongst the Muslims. And from the proof of that is the statement of Allah tabarakwa ta'ala. Ya yu alladheena amanu ati Allah wa ati al Allah Ta'ala states, O oh, you who believe, obey Allah and obey the Messenger and those that have been given authority and leadership over you, from amongst you. Ahlu Tafsir, the scholars of Tafsir, they mention relations to this ayah. First and foremost, that Allah Subhanahu Wa Ta'ala mentions, Ati Allah. Obey Allah. There he mentions, Ati' al-Rusul. Then obey the messenger. And then he mentions, Wa'ul al-Amri minkum. And those have been given authority over you. He doesn't mention the command. Ati'u. The reason for this, I will mention and we'll discuss it further shortly. The reason for this is that obedience to Allah, where we've been commanded, obedience to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is absolute. When Allah Ta'ala commands us of an affair, whether that be the command of in the book or the command upon the tongue of his messenger, sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, a person must adhere to that command and obey. It's absolute. For indeed, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala commands us. And so we must adhere to that from the wajibat, from the obligation. Thereafter, it mentions Ati al Rasul, obey the messenger. Again, this is absolute. For indeed, we know that the messenger of Allah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam does not speak from his desires. Rather, the speech of the Nabi sallallahu alayhi wa sallam is wahi min Allah. It's revelation from Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Wallahu kan min al fadihi huwa sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. And even if the words used are from himself, Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. So this is what we understand. So when we say, when we mention a hadith, is a hadith of Nabawi, in a prophetic hadith. What we understand by way of that is the ma'na, the meaning of the hadith is from Allah Subhanahu Wa Ta'ala. Na'amunazim al Indillah. It's been revealed by Allah, the meaning. As for the alfaz, as for the wordings, then the wordings may be from the Messenger of Allah. Sallallahu alayhi wa himself. However, because it's from the Allah, the, the meaning of it, we know that this is wahi, this, this is revelation. And so this is the clear distinction between يعني, what we have in terms of hadith al-Qudsi or hadith al-Nabawi. So we have a hadith al-Qudsi, which is a hadith where the messenger of Allah sallallahu alayhi wa narrates directly from Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. يعني, so he narrates directly from Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala in its meaning, and in its wording. And the words direct from Allah. By his hadith. Does that make sense? Now, and then we have a hadith of Nabawi. 
where the meaning is from Allah, but the words is used by the Messenger of Allah. And so, due to that, we state, due to that, we state that uh, anything in relation to the commands of the Messenger of Allah وسلم, has to be obeyed absolutely. Now, has to be obeyed absolutely. Thereafter, the ayah mentions, and those have been given authority نعم, upon you from amongst you. This wording here is not absolute. doesn't mention the command, أَتِيُوا or obey. Reason for that being is that obedience to the ruler is not absolute. And we'll mention, we'll discuss it again further. But obedience to the ruler is not absolute. Why? Because obedience to the ruler is an obedience now which has to be in, a, in line with the obedience of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. And so a person cannot disobey Allah tabarak wa ta'ala in order to obey the ruler. And so, this is not an absolute obedience. Thereafter, <coughs> Sheikh Bozan mentions by the hadith of the Messenger of Allah, sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, in the hadith of Mashhur, Usikum bi taqwa Allah, wa sama wa ta'a, wa ta'amara alaykum abdun habashim. And so, the Messenger of Allah, he, Sallallahu Alaihi mentions, I advise you with the taqwa of Allah, I advise you with piety in relation to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, and fearing Allah, and hearing and obeying, even if the Abyssinian slave has been given the authority over you, or as your ruler, or, as in another word it mentions, that. The Abdun Majadda ul Atraf that the that the slave that has his limbs, his limbs have been missing and cut off and been given authority over you. So what we understand from that is that as soon as someone is established as the ruler upon the Muslims, then upon you is a sam wa ta'a. Is here in an abayim. Yeah, here in an abayim. And it's an obligation. To obey that which is ma'roof, that which is the good. And so, what we understand from this as well, to mention further, listen to the Walid Amr, is that the, 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 the ruler has a, has a particular status amongst the Muslims. Now, has a high status amongst the Muslims. And so, it's not for you to now be from those individuals that essentially are distracted or led astray now when it comes to the matter of rulers because that which is prevalent is speaking ill of the ruler that which is prevalent is يعني, تنقص فيهم and when it comes to speaking about the ruler, yeah, and he's speaking about them in a lowly manner. However, this is makhalif lil aqeedah to salaf. It opposes the aqeedah of the salaf. Rather, the salaf were upon that which was opposite to that. The salaf were upon ta'zim. And he raised them in their status. <coughs> Why? Because with, with the state of the ruler being upright, then this will have a direct effect upon the mushama, the society, the community. And so, with that, we have this statement here by Imam Badruddin ibn Jama'ah. Imam Badruddin ibn Jama'ah, he mentioned that from the rights of the ruler, and this is from his hukuk, from the rights of the ruler, now, is that the person acknowledges the grandeur of his right itself I, as the ruler. And ya'arifu azim haqqihi. And that the person establishes yani his status. 
في عامل بما يجب له من الاحترام والإكرام. And so he deals with the ruler in that which is obligatory when it comes to that respect and dealing with good manners and nobility. وَمَا جَعَلَ اللَّهُ تَعَالَ لَهُ مِنْ عِظَامِ And what Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has placed for him in being made in being praised to that regard and raised at the correct, at the correct, as its, as its correct status. Now, وَلِذَلِكْ كَانَ الْعُلَامَاءَ الْأَعْلَامِ الْأَئِمَةِ الْإِسْلَامِ يَعَذِّمُونَ هُرْمَتُهُمْ and so due to that, the ulama, the scholars of Muslim, of the Muslims, of the of the Ummah, now amongst the Muslims, or the scholars of the of Islam, would raise this matter of the respect for the rulers and respect that they deserve. And that they would exert themselves when it came to da'wah, calling them. مع زهد وورع وعدم الطمع في ما لديهم so the scholars when they would advise them they would advise them with زهد وورع وورع وعدم الطمع في ما لديهم so when they would advise them they would advise them not لأجل الدنيا not because of anything to do with the dunya they wouldn't advise them due to anything that they would have within their own selves and longing for what the ruler himself has. But he would advise the ruler for his benefit. Because if you advise the ruler for his benefit, then this, <coughs> by extension, will benefit the people. So he does not benefit him or he does not advise him because he wants what he has. He wants to be the ruler himself. Well, he wants, an, he wants something, a portion of that rulership or leadership. He doesn't want that. He's advising him for the maslaha of the ruler himself and by extension of people. And so this is why he mentions, but Jama'ah mentions here, that he advises him with zuhud wa wara. Zuhud meaning that he abstains from the dunya. This is not why he's advising him. It's, it's not, and then it connects to the dunya itself. Even though the ruler himself <coughs> has status in dunya. That's not what he's longing for. This is why he mentions that it's a fair zuhud, da'am, and <coughs> and wara, na'am. So, wa ma yaf'aluhu ba'd al-muntasibin ila zuhud min kirat al-adri ma'ahu fa laysa min al-sunnah and so he doesn't do what some of those that ascribe to Zuhud do. So some individuals ascribe to being upon Zuhud, but they have lack of manners with them. Lack of manners with the rulers. And it's something you see now, like we mentioned. What do you see is more pre prevalent? Now, is it a case of Raising them and speaking well of them and mention the khair fi him and the good that he find within them. Or is the opposite scene that the people who talk about the Tanakhus, they talk about where they feel that they've fallen short, the rulers. And then when they mention them, they mention them in the most evil of terms. And this is an individual. Now, that is insignificant himself. But he feels the need to speak. Whilst he has no knowledge. Or whilst he's Montesib in ilm He ascribes to knowledge. Or he's Muta'alim. He's the one that feigns knowledge. As you find in some of the du'ats and the callers of this day and age. Irrespective of whichever land you find them in. Because they're within all the lands. That they say that we are the ones that have 
the, the, the concern of the Muslims. We are concerned about the affair of the Muslims the most more than anyone else. So this is why we have to speak about the rulers. We need change. Sometimes you hear that. We need change. How a person doesn't establish change within his own self. Doesn't have a change within his own self. Doesn't have a change within his own household. But he's got to the point where he said we need change. He doesn't change anything within his own self. And then he opposes the sunnah when it comes to the matter of the rulers. This is what we mentioned. Thereafter, Sheikh Fawzan explains the matter of the rulers as being one of Sam wa Ta'a. Here in Abayn, the Immat al Muslimin, the Immat, Fima Hibb Allah Yarda, in that which Allah Ta'ala loves and is pleased with. I'm in Ma'asiya, as for Ma'asiya, as for disobedience, Fala Yuta'un Fiha, as for Ma'asiya, then they're not obeyed in relation to the Ma'asiya. The rule is not obeyed when it comes to disobedience. This is according to the hadith of the Messenger of Allah Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam where he mentions لا طاعة للمخلوق في معصية الخالق that there's no disobedience or well, there's no obedience to the creation when it comes to disobedience to the creator of the Khalik Allah Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam you, know, you, do not, you do not now disobey Allah in order to obey anyone from the creation Thereafter, you have the narration as well. إِنَّمَا الطَّاعَةَ فِي الْمَعْرُوفِ Indeed, ta'a, indeed, when it comes to obedience, is in ma'roof, in that which is good. And so, Shaykh Hosea mentions the next point though. وَلَيْسَ مَعْنَا وَلَيْسَ مَعْنَا ذَلِكْ أَنَّهُ إِذَا عَمَرَ الْوَلِيَ الْعَمَرَ بِالْمَعْسِيَةِ من المعاصي أنها تنخلع إمامته. So it doesn't mean now that just because you don't obey him in disobedience, that his imama, his leadership, his role as a leader is removed from him. It doesn't mean that one doesn't necessitate the other. Now, just the fact that we don't obey him in disobedience doesn't mean now we don't obey him in disobedience. Then we overthrow him, remove him as imam. No. What it simply means is that we don't obey him in the disobedience. Now, بَلْ إِنَّهُ لَا يَتَعَى فِي الْمَعْسِيَةِ Rather, it means he's not obeyed in this ma'asiyah, in this disobedience. وَلَكَنْ يُطَعَى فِي مَا لَيْسَ فِيهِ مَعْسِيَةِ Rather, he is obeyed when there is no ma'asiyah, when there is no disobedience. So when he's obeyed, he's obeyed when there's no disobedience. What tabka will ayatuhu wa yata'a fi ma laysa bi ma'asiyah. And so his leadership and guardianship over the people remains. However, he's not, uh, he's not obeyed, he's obeyed if as long as it's not ma'asiyah, as long as it's not disobedience. And so what's important to state here with this is that it doesn't mean now, just because you don't like what the Imam's done, that you can say, I'm going to disobey him. No. As long as it's, as long as it's not Matsi, as long as it's not disobedience to Allah, you have to obey him in that. And obey him in his choice. And so, again, the person should not allow shaitan to deceive them as well. Where a person seeks to try and find a way that the, what the imam is doing is a, in his court is, is, a, is disobedience rather. And is opposed to haq. Just because he doesn't like the rule in itself. A person must be sincere. And then if, if it comes to the ruling that the rulers come with, he follows him in that. And obeys him in that. Because in that is mutaba to sunnah. Following the sunnah. And within that is barakah. Within that is blessing and khayr. Thereafter, he goes on to mention now that relation to the wali that 
نعم ومن ولي الخلافة بالإجماع الناس عليه رضاهم به فهو أمير المؤمنين and so who has been given this authority by way of the إجماع الناس the consensus of the people and the fact that they are pleased and they and that they approve of that then this person is established as the Amir al Mu'minin. He's established as the Amir al Mu'minin. And so, now, the Imama, the leadership, is established by different means. Established by different means. This is by Shaykh Yani al Fawzan. Al Amr al Awwal, the first of these, is. من من اختاره المسلمون. and the first is the one that the Muslims have approved of and chosen. and now what was meant by the the, in the choice of the Muslims is the choice from those that are known as أهل الحل والعقد. أهل الحل والعقد are the ulama and the umara. وأصحاب السياسة وأمراء الأجناد. so when it comes to this أهل الحل والعقد، then it's not just everyone. it is a case that is referring to the ulama, the people of knowledge, the people of Islamic knowledge. now referring to the أمراء يعني other leaders. now other people that have leadership. referring as well to أهل أصحاب السياسة. And people that have knowledge when it comes to siyasa, politics. And they're referring to as well, the Umar al-Ajnad. The, the leaders amongst the armies and military. That these individuals are those that come together to appoint the ruler. These individuals that come together to appoint the ruler. And then it's an important point to hear that the Sheikh mentions thereafter. وليس معناه على الاختيار الإمام لكل أحد من السبيان والنساء وحضر والبدو نعم <coughs> and so what is meant by the choice of the Muslims is not that it's the choice of everyone it's the choice of everyone whether it be the young, the old the men, the women, all the men, all the women whether it be the person <coughs> that lives in Abadia, was in the countryside, the person that lives within the city, every individual. No, it's not the case. And so this now, this matter that is mentioned here by the Qalafikum, directly opposes what? Democracy. This is what is mentioned here. How the rulers are appointed directly opposes Democracy. And what is held up as democracy, and it's held up. When you hear democracy mentioned, now you hear democracy mentioned as if it is the only choice. Now, when you hear democracy mentioned, for example, if they were to ask, when you hear people ask, yani the West, yani those that have the Afkar from the West, and they ask, what is wrong with Balad Kever? What is wrong with this particular nation? And they, the answer would be they're undemocratic. They know this, they don't go into any further detail. They would say they're undemocratic. As if it's understood that to be undemocratic is makhalif al haq. To be undemocratic is opposed to truth. Democracy is the haq. If you oppose democracy, then it's opposed to truth. Just as if someone says, what is wrong with this particular land or this particular person, I would say that the person is not Muslim. Every Muslim understands, naam, that Islam is the haq. And so if we say that this person is not Muslim, it's directly understood that the person is a Pombatid. And this is how democracy has been, has been presented, as this is an absolute truth. Naam. However, as we just discussed, when it comes to the ikhtiyar and the choice of a ruler, then the choice of the ruler is done by those that are, yani, ahlan lidhalik. Those that have, or those that are qualified to do so. And we mentioned, who did we mention? You can remember. The ulama. Because if we're talking about the ruler, that's something that someone's going to rule over the Muslims, then 
We need to know the person that's going to choose them. That's have Islamic knowledge. Now to the ulama. Who else will be mentioned? Other leaders. Now the other leaders, leaders will recognize who has those characteristics that are befitting of a leader. Why? Because he's a leader himself. Now, who else? Those have, those have political knowledge. Now, why? Because if a person needs to enter into, into politics or some degree of politics, now the person needs to know who has the, who has the most or who's most suited for that. I will mention finally, lead of the armies and military. Because essentially the ruler is going to be the ruler over the armies. And so the army themselves, they will know who is suitable to lead them and command them if needs be. So it makes sense. These are the individuals that, that, that choose the ruler. Then we go back to what we have here, democracy. And it's pertinent for those that don't, for those that don't know. In this country, we have elections soon. And if you don't know, alhamdulillah, you don't need to know. But the reality is, is that people ask, when, when the time, election time comes around, people ask the question, should we vote? Or why can't we vote? Or why should we vote? Or whatever the question is. But questions are, yeah, in respect of the wording, is essentially the same question. First and foremost, the affair of democracy, as mentioned by Sheikh Muhammad Aman al Jami, is based upon yani kawaid that are batil. The whole concept itself, democracy itself as a whole, is based upon principles that are completely false. Based on principles that are completely false. And that is based upon principles that uh, promote what is regarded as being hurriya, freedom. Now, on the face of it, it's fair seeming. I freedom is fair seeming. Freedom is something which is seen as in, in every sense of the word as positive. Why? Because the opposite of that is that the person is mamluk, is owned, or the person is a slave. But the reality is that we are all slaves. Ibad Rahman. We're slaves of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. We are bound by kawaid. We are bound by principles. We are bound by rulings. We're servants of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. So we're not just free to do everything that we want to do. Now, we're not an individual. He's followed his desires. Now, but this is a matter of democracy is built upon specific pillars and principles that revolve around this matter of freedom. The first of them that is mentioned is freedom, naam, freedom when it comes to the deen. Freedom of deen. What is meant by that, Alikha? Freedom of deen. Be whatever you want to be. Worship Allah, worship Isa, Worship all of the gods of the, of the Hindus, for example. Worship Uzair. Worship this and what. Do whatever you wish to do. Or don't worship anything. Be mulhid, be an atheist. You have the freedom to do whatever you wish to do. Now, that's the first thing. They say this builds one freedom. Do whatever you wish to do. Then you have يعني, the freedom, as they mentioned, the freedom when it comes to يعني, the mushtama. Freedom in society. So you have societal freedom. What do you think that means? I have societal freedom. Do whatever you want, be whatever you want. What does, it, what does it mean though, essentially? What does it lead to? Homosexuality. That's one thing. No, homosexuality. What else? Sin. Sin, transgression, zina. All of these things. It, it's, it's something which opens up the door to fornication. Opens up the door, naam, to yeah, adultery. Opens up the door to the breakdown of the family unit. That a person does whatever they wish to do. And you find that when it's societal freedom, then you have freedom, that's, that's freedom when it comes to relationships, but also freedom when it comes to 
what society regards as being upright or not. So what was taboo, now what was looked down upon in society 50 years ago, is seen as adi now, seen as normal now. What we mean by way of that is a person has personal freedoms. So a person <coughs> can take drugs or drink alcohol and be drunk. And it's seen as, it would depend on society, as normal. In this country, we have individuals that aim to get drunk. That's their aim. Like tonight, like, it's even like tonight, Saturday night, or Friday night, their aim is to get drunk. Their aim is to go out, drink, and not remember what happened the night before. Not remember. That's the hadith, that's the goal. So then now, the question is, what does society say about that? The society says that except, nothing except he's free to do whatever he wants to do. He's free to do whatever he wants to do. And the only time you see people get upset, the reality is, when do you think people get upset about people getting drunk? Harm others or harm themselves. Because now you're, you're, you're harming the NHS. Now it's a problem for the NHS. Now it's a, harm, a problem for the services. But the issue was before all of that. Before that, they, the, the fact that they became a burden upon the services. The fact that they now this is a societal acceptance. Thereafter as well, from the Hurriya that is mentioned by Sheikh Muhammad Aman as well, is Hurriyat al Qanun. Yani, the person that has freedom, freedom when it comes to the Qanun, when it comes to legislation, laws. Freedom when it comes to laws. Reality is, is that as we mentioned, we are bound, we are servants of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. We are bound by the ahkam of Allah. We are bound by the laws that Allah ta'ala has set down for us. However, in this matter of democracy, they push the freedom of laws, that any man can make any law. And that he would base it upon the masaha of that particular place or time. But we know that the sharia of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is munasib, is suitable and correct for every place and time. But now we have freedom to kanu. So now, Going back to the question, the central question of this matter of voting, the first thing is, you all you're going to do is engage in this matter of the freedom of legislation and lawmaking. That the person, one individual is going to say that I'm going to make these laws because I think that these laws are, it doesn't matter what you think. We have the Quran and the Sunnah. We have the habit of Allah, the robe of Allah. So how is it now that the person is going to say that whatever he believes to be correct, or his party believes to be correct, that this is the correct way to live the life? No. Al-Khaliq, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, he has set down that which is correct, the correct way for us to live. So this all we're doing is choosing the individual that is going to enact that hurriyat to the that's going to enact that freedom of legislation. That is not a real true freedom. That's one thing. Another thing as well when it comes to this matter of voting. Is that the reality is, is that it's all a manner of khuruj in of itself. That the person by way of this voting is engaging in yani, a manner of seeking to overthrow their ruler. And this is what you hear as well. And this is the ibarat that people use. They will say that if you're not happy with your government, vote them out at the ballot box. You hear them say this. If you're not happy with your government, essentially, fire them, sack them, make khuruj against them, يعني, call, it, call it what it is, at the ballot box. Again, this is khuj. Likewise, with this as well, 
this manner of voting and intikhabat and elections is that it's devoid of justice. As mentioned, as we just discussed here from the Kalam of Sheikh Fawzan, that it's devoid of justice. Why? Because every single individual's vote has the same khima. Every single individual's vote has the same value. So the individual, you have one individual, he's lived, he's lived in this, let's say for use the example of this country, he's lived his life through yeah, decades. He's seen what a, a, a conservative government looks like, he sees what this prime minister does, he's seen what that prime minister does, he's seen what, what, this, what a Labour government looks like, whatever the case may be. But he's seen, and, he's, and he has experience in it, let's say as well. When he votes, his vote is going to be the exact same as a person that may still be in college as 18 years old. He lives at home. He hasn't paid a bill. He doesn't know what inflation is. For example. But this, this person's vote is the same as this person's vote. Is that for justice? Of course not. That's why we mentioned that it's laid out those that establish who the ruler is are people that are ahlal lidalik. Those that establish who the ruler is, they are people that are qualified to do so. Those that know Islamic knowledge. Those that have knowledge of politics. Those that have knowledge when it comes to yani, the uh, military. Everyone has this particular place. And this would not be present in any other facet of life. For example, if you had uh, a company now you have a, a company and the company has a CEO and it's, it's a company with massive it's a massive company with all his employees and their yeah, their survival is based on their profit margins and all the rest of that are they going to ask every single individual who should be the CEO of course not the CEO is going to be appointed by those that know what a CEO looks like knows what an executive should do it's not going to be any individual. So how come we can accept that when it comes to major companies? Now, I'm sure it We can accept that. But we can't accept that when it comes to nations. And individuals that are, that are responsible for millions of people. How come this is acceptable that's not? Of course, it's barter. It's a falsehood. And it's a deception from the shaitan, essentially. And Allah Ta'ala knows best. So, as mentioned... This is how the Imam is chosen. And this is how it was established with the Khilafah of Abu Bakr as Siddiq. That the people, the Muslims, made ijma, they made it came to a consensus after the death of the Messenger of Allah sallallahu alayhi wa upon the Khilafah of Abu Bakr as Siddiq. They come to a consensus. And the significance of consensus is due to the fact that the Messenger of Allah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam mentioned La tashlami ummati ala dola That my ummah will not unite upon falsehood. So when the ummah and the Muslim come to consensus in a particular matter then we know that this is yani al haq and we mentioned the consensus that we were mentioning those that are again or ahlu ikhtisas. Those that were specific in that matter. And specific knowledge of that matter. And from the adilla that they used to come to that conclusion that Abu Bakr Siddiq should be the Khalifa. The first of the proof that they used was that Abu Bakr Siddiq yani bil itlaq in an absolute sense. Absolutely agreed upon. That he, Radi Anhu, was the best of the companions. It was itlaq. It was agreed upon by the Muslims. They knew this. The second is that there were particular indications given that he, Radi Anhu, would be from those that would follow the Messenger of Allah, Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, i.e., leadership. From them, was that when the Messenger of Allah Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam was ill, the illness 
that led essentially to his death. Then he saw so and put Abu Bakr Siddiq forward to lead the salah. And so he led and he stood in the place of the Nabi Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. And of course, this is an indication of that. And so this is from the matter. And likewise as well, when Abu Bakr Siddiq approached the Ani, Now, so this is the first matter, right, how the person is established by Ahlul Halilullah. Then the second matter, the second matter in which you establish the ruler, Salaam. is that the Khalifa himself, or the ruler himself, he mentions this is going to be, this Fulan is going to be the next ruler, as which was done during the time of Abu Bakr Siddiq, anhu. Where he specified, he mentioned specifically that Umar al Khattab will follow him as a Khalifa. And so the people heard and obeyed. The people heard and obeyed. So that's the second manner. And the third is that if one person from amongst the Muslims takes control, sees the control, And so the people with that yani, accept him as the ruler. Then with that he becomes the emir. With that he becomes the emir. And the example given was after the death of Yazid ibn Muawiyah. Then Abdul Malik ibn Marwan ibn Hakam he took control of the rulership and the people accepted that from him. So essentially, if a person has that ability and seizes control, then they are regarded as being the ruler in that matter. So those are the three. Those are the three ways that a person Islamically is established as the ruler. Now, who can repeat them for me? The three ways that a person can be established as the ruler. The three that I mentioned. Abu Bakr was, uh, it was agreed upon by the Sahaba that he should be But and, and this particular, was it all the Sahaba? Yeah, it was all of them. And, uh, was it all of them? Uh, except for Ali. No, Ahl uh, al-Halil or al Meaning what? Yes. They were who then? What, what, what we say Ahl al-Halil or al what do we mean by way of them? <laughs> that they were? <laughs> ulama? Umara, yani the scholars, the, the lead of the rulers, or uh, now, other people in charge. Ashab Siyasa, people that knew politics. And those that were the Umara, the rule, or the, those that are in charge amongst the militaries. Now, so that's one way. Now, is that clear the first way, Barakallah, people? Is that clear? Mm -hmm. Second way. <coughs> mm. The leader says who the next one will be. So the leader himself appoints Naam the next leader. An example we gave was what? 
Abu Bakr mentioned in who? Onur al-Khattab. Now, and in the third, that the person says she seizes control. So then the, you have, Yani, when it seizes, when it seizes, seizes control, we mean by way of that, that there is a vacancy. So there's no ruler. So this person seizes control of that. And he's recognized to be someone that is, that can take control. Now, and when, we don't, when, we say, when we say seizing control, we don't mean now that he makes khuruj and seizing control in that manner. Now, it's important to distinguish between the two. That essentially there is a void. And so in that void, so in that, in that gap, the person seizes control of that time. So those are the three, Baruch Allah Fikr. Those are the three. And inshallah, we'll continue next week. Baruch Allah Fikr, Jazakallah Khairah. And uh, I'll ask you again on the three, inshallah. Baruch Allah Fikr, Jazakallah Khairah. صلى الله وبارك على نبينا محمد وعلى اله وصحبه وسلم واشهد ان الحمد لله رب العالمين